Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And again, thanks for being here despite the rain, the weather, and the virus. Um, OK, so we all know who said, let food be thy medicine first. But let's move into what the substance of that is. I have really no disclosures. All my funding is from public bodies, uh, government agencies. And I do sit on a national working group uh, with the government on low carbohydrate nutrition. Right, so the bottom right hand side here, uh, I'm going to try and increase that overlapping Venn diagram somewhat because I know what I want to say with these five chosen things in my portfolio for tonight that I've put together, but you might be interested in slightly different aspects. So if I miss anything, because the topic is absolutely vast, uh, I will miss certain things that are topics close to your personal hearts. In the Q&A session, hopefully we can pick up on some of those. Okay, so what I thought we would do today is firstly, just to set the scene, say a little bit about diabetes, because I'm going to talk about food in relation to type 2 diabetes in particular. <clears throat> then I'm going to pose two questions. Is, to type, is type 2 diabetes preventable? And if you have type 2 diabetes, is it reversible? Can it be reversed? Then I'm going to talk about individual and population approaches in this whole space of food and health, and then how do we move forward with it. So that's my agenda. Let's see what yours is. Right, so if I was to ask people in the audience, I'm sure you know at least somebody who has diabetes, and some perhaps have it themselves, and there are different types of diabetes. But really, what is diabetes? So it's a disorder of glucose metabolism. We do know that. Blood sugar levels are basically at the heart of what manifests itself. But is it really high glucose levels, or uh, as in it's a continuous distribution? So wherever you are within that distribution, there's an increased risk. An increased risk of what? Or is it the upper end of a distribution? So you know, you all know about these uh, bell-shaped curves of normal distributions. Is it just the top 5%, 10% of that? So, and, or is it about symptoms, when somebody presents with the symptoms of diabetes? Or really, is it about what happens, and diabetes is really just a term which is what it reflects that you go on to develop? It is all of those things, in fact. And here's a study uh, that was done close to here, just north of Cambridge in Ely, several years ago, uh, 25 years ago. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see that. Um, OK. Uh, 1995. And what that showed is that in the population in Ely, in one single practice which was serving Ely at the time, if we did a blood test in everyone registered in that practice, and we knew they did not have diabetes at the time, then about 5% showed up on a blood test, a two-hour glucose, to have diabetes. And just under 20% showed up to what we would call pre-diabetes. And IGT stands for impaired glucose tolerance, which is a term we give when there's impaired glucose regulation. So, in terms of whether it's a continuous, the top end of a distribution, or whether it's just high glucose levels, well, we have evidence from wider research that both of these conditions are related to the endpoints or the complications of diabetes, but with a more accelerated uh, rate once you have diabetes. So this is what diabetes is in terms of how it uh, what it can do to the body once you have that state and that dysregulation of glucose. Basically, it can affect a person from top to toe. And I've divided this up into what we call macro and microvascular complications, basically big vessels and small vessels in the body. So um, with big vessel disease, we know that risk of heart attacks it goes up massively. Uh, stroke risk is increased. And there is big vessel disease, which affects uh, the, the, the wider uh, vasculature of the body. And then there's the small vessel disease. And this is where we get the eye disease uh, and, and kidney disease and where people lose sensation. 
And if unchecked, and this is by no means the fate of everyone with diabetes, but this is the problem with diabetes that we worry about, and that is the potential consequences, and they are severe. So this is showing the clogging up of the arteries. Uh, you get uh, higher risk of uh, heart attacks. This is somebody's, the back of somebody's uh, retina, the eye, which has had laser treatment. And uh, th that's because you get retinopathy. And then when you lose sensation, you can't feel things in your shoes, etc. You get ulcers, you get uh, gangrene, and amputations, of course, is a problem. And people end up with renal failure and dialysis. So it's a pretty serious condition. And that's why we are concerned. And then there is the additional burden of the fact that there is what I call the clinical iceberg. People who GPs have diagnosed, because people have turned up to their surgeries and said, I don't feel right, I've got these symptoms. They show up, but beneath this, there is a whole iceberg of undiagnosed cases of people who don't have symptoms yet, but if for some other reason they were to present to the GP uh, and a blood test was done, they would have had a biochemical test that would show up as being diabetic, but they have not yet had symptoms. And uh, how long does it take between being asymptomatic to developing symptoms and actually having undiagnosed diabetes? Well, in Western populations, it's thought to be anywhere between three to seven years, but it can be as long as 10 years in other populations. So the disease grumbles on for a while. And that's why we ask the question, well, how much diabetes, uh, undiagnosed diabetes is there? And should we find out uh, whether there's undiagnosed diabetes? And if so, how? How do we do the screening? Now, in our NHS, which is wonderful, we have all sorts of capabilities and facilities. Uh, we can contemplate this question. But of course, don't forget in many settings in the world, in global contexts, uh, people simply don't contemplate this because they can barely cope, if at all, with people who are already diagnosed. So a sobering point, this. Now, I wanted to show you the global burden. I sit on this committee internationally. This is the International Diabetes Federation, and we produce estimates on the um, global uh, burden of diabetes. This is all diabetes put together. And we've been doing this for a number of years, and this is the latest estimates that were released on World Diabetes Day in November, November 14th, just 2019. And it's a really uh, depressing picture, I would say, because throughout the world, what these arrows are showing you, they're all going up. Nowhere have we seen a down arrow yet. So this means that compared to the 2019 data, our projections going into 2030 and 2045 are basically uh, uh, just up and up and up. And if you look more carefully, you'll see that the burden in Africa and Middle East and Southeast Asia is massive. So, and these are often the economies that are least geared to coping with these. So the burden is huge. So it's a serious problem, and there's a lot of it. Closer to home, uh, I've also worked on data to uh, get these numbers. So from the GP databases, of course, we can get the number of people in the UK, in its constituent uh, nations, of how much diagnosed diabetes there is. But to get at this number, we have built a model in the past, and it's been adopted by Public Health England and, and the AFO models. Uh, the total burden, now you will understand that in the context of that undiagnosed burden. So if you look at people who have diabetes and don't know about it as well, that's nearly 5 million at the moment in the UK. And uh, to very briefly say, uh, most of you probably already know this, but diabetes is of many different types, but the commonest is type 2 diabetes, which is the focus of what I'm going to be talking about today, and that makes up around 90% of all diabetes. Then there's type 1 diabetes, and there are other forms of uh, diabetes with a uh, strong uh, genetic component and diabetes of the young. So these two main types, type 1 diabetes, is classically understood as what is autoimmune. That means the body starts uh, reacting against uh, itself, basically. Uh, and there is destruction of the cells in uh, beta cells in the pancreatic islets, which means you just have a, a deficiency of insulin. 
uh, and insulin is needed to put the glucose away from the food that we eat uh, into the cells. And when that isn't there, the only way to survive is to take injections of insulin. But in type 2 diabetes, it's a totally different game. So what happens here is that there's resistance to the action of insulin at the main tissues or organs where it acts, which is the liver, the muscle. Um, and um, what happens as a result of that is uh, you, you get buildup of glucose levels in the body. And in fact, for several years, you actually have not only enough insulin, you hypercompensate because you're trying to deal with that glucose which is rising. So the pancreas goes into hyperdrive and produces masses more insulin. So typically, if you measure insulin levels in type 2 diabetes, quite opposite to type 1, the levels are actually higher. They're raised. Okay? It's only when the pancreas basically runs out of steam, when it's had to work so hard, that it gives up in the end. And that's when you end up into insulin deficiency. And often, then you need insulin injections, even in type 2 diabetes. OK, so that's a very brief and rapid run through the condition. Um, and the risk factors for it, uh, there are many. But the, the key ones that I've highlighted here are to do with, as we become older, we get type 2 diabetes. But just to note that increasingly, young people and children as young as 14, 15, even 13 have been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. So this is rising in younger populations, but classically, it's over 40. Family history and genetics matter, and ethnicity uh, increases the predisposition. So people like me of South Asian origin and African origin have much higher rates than Middle Eastern people compared to white Europeans. I've done a lot of work in that, my own PhD, as well as being a medical, uh, as a physician, a diabetologist, I also trained in um, uh, epidemiology, to, and, and, and this was my area of study, to look at ethnic differences in met cardiometabolic risk. Uh, so these are pretty fixed factors. We can't change these. But what we can change are these other factors, weight gain, lack of physical activity, and of course, the subject of today, which is about food and diet. These are modifiable factors, and that's what really matters. That's not to say we're not interested in these. Of course we are, because for therapeutic agents and for all sorts of other actions, we need to understand both. OK, so it's serious. There's a lot of it. We now understand a little bit about uh, tonight about what the condition is. And its public health impact is massive. OK, so let me show you this first. So this is UK data. Did you know that we do spend more on the treatment of obesity and diabetes than across our police, fire service, and judicial system combined? OK? So this is massive. And I've shown you the morbidity, which is the illness that you get with diabetes. And of course, not a surprise that then life expectancy is reduced. It's reduced by around 5 to 10 years. But actually, in certain settings, it's massively more than that, 20 years, 25 years lower than what your span would have been if you didn't. The cost is massive. The cost is both financial and non-financial. Financial cost is that in the UK, every hour we're spending one million pounds on this condition. And of course, the non-financial impacts are on people, on human beings, on their carers, on their families, and on society. So management of diabetes is clearly important. It is vital. But we also have to turn the tap off at some point. And how do we do that? So prevention is really important. And this is not a language that we were speaking really only a handful of years ago. We were only talking about when people have diabetes, how do we deal with it? And then I think we also now are in a space where we can contemplate thinking about what about reversal. So I'm going to cover uh, prevention and reversal today. And I'm going to focus on modifiable factors, because that's where we can take action. So we, I think, have reversed evolution. It took us millions of years to evolve. And in a very short span of time, we have changed how we look. Right. So is diabetes preventable? Hands up, all of you who think we can get to primary prevention of type 2 diabetes. Turn the tap off and not have diabetes at all. Show of hands. OK, not quite 50%. Thank you. Um, 
So the answer is yes, and we have clinical trial evidence. Uh, the first one was the diabetes prevention trial in uh, the US, and this was done in, in a high-risk group, people who were already overweight or obese and who had that prediabetes, and randomized into three different groups, um, either business as usual, so people who were overweight and with prediabetes were just receiving usual care, or they were put in, onto this drug metformin, or they were given intensive lifestyle advice and group sessions and some individual sessions. And I had put my money when I, this trial was first being done that actually metformin will come out tops because metformin is a primary drug that we use to treat people with type 2 diabetes. So why wouldn't it work in prediabetes? But we were all staggered when we saw that the risk reduction was actually much greater, almost double the magnitude in the intensive lifestyle group. So that gave a lot of impetus to do, understand this more and understand this better. Since then, a lot of other trials have been done. For example, there was the Indian diabetes prevention trial, the Finnish DPS uh, diabetes prevention study, and uh, a few others. And, and, and there was a big one in China too, the da, da Ching study, very similar design with slight modifications. And what is staggering is they all consistently show the same. So lifestyle intervention can achieve, uh, certainly delay the onset of diabetes, and there are some follow-up studies to 20 years on in the Da Ching study from China, which show that the intervention which lasted for a very short time in this trial, there's a legacy effect, some sort of metabolic imprinting and, and sort of change in lifestyle that people followed up 20 years later still maintain that difference. So if they were in the intensive lifestyle originally, they still remain diabetes-free 20 years on. Okay. Now, to the real world. That's in the world of trials. What is diet? What is the exposure? It is a mixed bag of many things, but let's see if we can make it, give it some uh, systematic approach. So we worry a lot about quantity, how many calories and how, what the uh, intakes should be in terms of grams of this and grams of that. But of course, the quality and composition matter a massive amount too. So this is really just a cartoon I've put together to show that there are multiple components, the prime top layer being that it's about the calorie or the total energy intake, and that, of course, is linked to your portion size, and then your macronutrients, carbohydrates, fats, and protein, make up that total energy intake. There are micronutrients, and there are quality aspects, uh, like the energy density or the nutrient density, and then, of course, these are Ultimately, what we eat are foods from which we get the nutrients. So there's a huge tension on should scientists be studying nutrients? Should they be studying foods? Should they be studying overall dietary patterns? And I'll show you in a second where that has led us. Now, there are all these other things which I shan't read out, but the list goes on and on and on. Because on the one hand, people want to know, oh, if I have more chili, will that be good for me or bad for me? Or if I have cinnamon, will that be good for me or bad for me? But on the other hand, we also want to get back at the higher level of exposure, as it were. So it's, it's, it's a tricky balance. How detailed should we go and what sort of study design enables us to study that diversity? Okay, so there is no shortage of the medical literature publishing papers. In the last 20 years, there have been a quarter of a million papers published on diet and cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and obesity alone. This is before we start looking at cancer, mental health, and various other things, okay? So that's what, 12 and a half thousand papers a year, medical published papers in peer-reviewed journals. And no wonder, every day you have this wheel of um, fortune, right? How many of you have totally given up on the dietary messages that are coming out? Today alcohol is good for you, tomorrow is bad for you. Coffee was great yesterday, but it's not so good today. Okay, so there's this yo-yoing, and we have to acknowledge that, there, that this is an issue. The latest one in the saga, how many of you have been aware of the meat controversy? Raise your hands, please. Okay, pretty much all of you. Okay, who could have missed it? There were seven papers in a very prestigious uh, journal, Annals of Internal Medicine, 
and basically is giving us a license basic, saying eat what you want, all the red meat and processed meat that you want. Are they right? Are they wrong? The point is that if we keep doing this, we lose the public's trust. Okay. But the challenge is how do we separate the wheat from the chaff? Okay. So agencies, uh, authoritative bodies like the World Health Organization and others, uh, do evidence reviews, which try to apply some uh, uniform and defensible criteria to appraise that huge literature that is out there to separate the wheat from the chaff. And interestingly, about 15, 16, 17 years ago, when this appraisal was done for diet and diabetes, not a single diet factor was found with convincing evidence. Okay? But fast forward to now, where are we today? Well, we have made major progress in understanding the link between diet and the prevention of disease, and type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So there are many appraisals. This was one we did uh, in 2018. There are many guidelines from august bodies, American Diabetes Association, Diabetes UK, and uh, various uh, national uh, agencies produce these in, in, in different countries. And there is this very useful diagram that was put together a couple of years ago summarizing what the, the, the good, the ugly, if you like, and the not so bad foods might be for diabetes. And what this, you might think, oh, well, after all this, you know, billions of pounds of research, is that what you're going to tell us? So if that's what you think, please leave the room now. <laughs> because out there, there is utter confusion even despite some agencies coming up with this. There is firstly this understanding. Let me summarize what I take away from this. We used to always say, well, have everything in moderation and it'll be fine. And I think that understanding has now changed. I don't think it's about have everything in moderation. Actually, you need to eat more of certain things and totally avoid certain others. Okay? And there are some things where there is ongoing uncertainty and we need more research and we need to also be humble enough to acknowledge that. So it's not moderation in everything. And a balanced diet, as you uh, quoted earlier, what is a balanced diet? Well, we don't have a single answer, but I think we're getting close to it. I think we, as we go through the rest of this, I hope you will leave this talk feeling a little bit more confident uh, and less confused. OK. But with all that, in the real world, what's going on? So, you know, the pendulum seems to be, and the yo-yo seems to be going up and down between it's all about go for low fat or it's all about go for uh, low carb. In fact, in this, where you go towards the ketogenic end, etc., you cut out virtually almost all the carbohydrates or very low carbohydrate intake in the ketogenic regime. And in fact, you increase your fat and with it protein intake. So is this backed by science or is this just what's being promoted. And there are indeed um, lots of reasons why some of the confusion is out there. Some of it is because the science is difficult. Nutritional research is very hard to do because the classic pharmaceutical type pro uh, clinical trial that we can do where we give people one drug and then give them a placebo and they don't know it can be double blind and randomized controlled, you can't do that for diet. Who amongst you will be prepared to go on a diet for the next 15 years till some condition develops in you? And when you go on that flight or go on that holiday or have a birthday, you will not break that diet. Hands up, anyone? <laughs> right. That is why dietary research is challenging. So people say, why aren't there randomized controlled trials? Well, we have to rely on smart combination of designs to come up with the um, uh, conclusions. Right. So. There is a lot of vested interest in this field, too. There are celebrity endorsements, there are adverts, and there's, uh, the media is constantly, you know, where every time a paper of ours, come, uh, of ours comes out, I want to go and hide somewhere because the media hound me down. Oh, you found this. Well, this is not for public consumption. For this paper, 
I would quite like this to be a debate amongst the scientists, because if it goes out into the public domain, everyone will then say, oh, but yesterday you said this, and now today you're saying that. But there's an insatiable need, it seems, in the media to pick up on every single uh, paper. So there are lots of reasons, but what is the evidence? So I'm going to cut through three main topics uh, to see if we can help move all of this from confusion to clarity. And these three are on what diets are best for weight management, what uh, we should do about this seesaw between the carbs and the fats versus uh, the, the actual foods they come from, and what about this debate on quantity and quality. Okay, so before we get to that weight management uh, data on which diets are best, first principle, it's uh, many physicists I think here, law of thermodynamics, and energy intake, and energy expenditure. When there's an imbalance and there's more of the intake, of course, you deposit fat, you get obesity. Between obesity, this is body mass index down here, and incidence, that means new onset of diabetes in the future, there's a very, very stark relationship. So as body mass index goes up, the risk of diabetes goes up pretty astronomically. Once you get to BMIs of 35 and, or even 30, the risks are you know, 20, 30 fold higher, okay? So in this paradigm, a calorie is a calorie. And therefore for weight, that matters. And we know that in the short term, calorie restriction works. We've all tried to fit into that dress or that suit for a special occasion, right? It worked, but what dietary advice? So here was a, uh, uh, in fact, a meta-analysis where all the studies that were available at a particular time were analyzed together in a network meta-analysis. It included data from nearly 50 randomized controlled trials of all these different types of diet regimes, name diets, Atkins, South Beach Zone, uh, Biggest Loser, Rosemary Conley, Weight Watchers, etc. And these were designed to be low carb, moderate macronutrients, or low fat. Any idea which one would have worked the best? Or any favorites? Which would you like to work best? Any answers? Shout it out. No wrong answers in this lecture. They all fail. Okay. Have you read the paper? Okay. Good guess. Anyone else? Yes. Okay. Right. So let's see what they found. You were not quite right, they did all work, but they only, and, and the weight loss across them was actually similar. So if you follow a low carb regime, you do lose weight. If you follow a low fat regime, you do lose weight. But you were absolutely right, it's about the adherence. So when people don't follow the advice, the weight creeps back up. Um, and they concluded that any diet that a patient will adhere to is the one that works. Okay, not convinced, let's have another look. So here is another meta-analysis more recently of all the world literature in a systematic way. So this is not selective or cherry picking. This is all the literature that was available of RCTs, randomized controlled trials of these diets. And when low fat diet was compared against the usual diet, there was overall about a five kilo weight difference mean difference between uh, the, the averages across these populations in these studies. But when low fat and low carbohydrate diets were compared head to head with each other, indeed the low carbohydrate diet was the winner and lots of people got very excited about it. But I think a measure of um, rationality is needed because look at the magnitude of the difference, okay? One kilo difference between the two. So statistically, of course, this is on this side, which means rather than low fat, the low carb diets work better. But uh, th th this is only one kilo. And these were studies specially chosen to be one, uh, ones that were at least of one year follow-up duration. Okay, so, so it wasn't just about in 12 weeks how much weight do you lose, which is where many studies end, because again, as we said, RCTs are very difficult to do. So when people go the distance and they do this for a year, 
uh, this is what is seen. So the difference is modest. There is some indication that perhaps low carb is better than low fat, but beware the difference, uh, the, the, the magnitude of the difference. Another approach, which is of course now very popular, is around intermittent fasting. And this can take many forms. It could be daily or alternate day, calorie reduction by about 25%. It could be the 5-2. Has everyone heard of the 5-2 diet? Seen Michael Mosley on TV? Okay, so 500 to 700 calories two days a week. Uh, or time-restricted feeding is getting a lot of uh, traction these days. So basically, you limit your time window over which you eat. So you eat really late for your first meal, i.e. breakfast, and then you squash all your eating within six hours or eight hours of the day, and then you're fasting the rest of the time. There's less evidence on these for long-term uh, endpoints, uh, but they certainly, in shorter-term studies, are proving that they are effective. So my takeaway message from this is that while there is a multi-billion dollar industry which will try and help you with these things, adherence is a huge challenge. And particularly for that reason, you've got to experiment and find the diet that is going to work for you and you can stick to. Because otherwise, you'll forever be yo-yoing and perhaps rebound uh, weight gaining beyond what you started off from. Okay, so that second point I said I would talk about was about food versus nutrients. So let's uh, look at dietary fat as one example. So pretty much all the guidelines universally talk about reducing total fat intake. This is where they used to end, but then they were more nuanced that it was the saturated fat that needed to be reduced. And the guidelines generally are to keep it under 10% of total energy or in the US under 7% of your total calorie intake per day. But there has been a fresh look at the evidence, and really to give you the top line first, we need to acknowledge complexity. It ain't that simple. So I want to give you four facts about dietary saturated fat. Firstly, fat is not just fat. So fat, we used to talk about have a low fat diet, but that today is almost meaningless. With our current understanding, we now know that there are different types of fatty acids. And then within the fatty acids, there are subtypes. So unsaturated fats are mono or polyunsaturated. And of course, you've heard of the omega-3 and the omega-6 fatty acids, omega-3 being like the things that come from fish, and hence the interest in fish oils and so on. And within uh, a usual calorie intake, there's a balance of these nutrients, so fat if you have more or less of, you will have more or less of these other things. That is why when we say low fat diet, de facto we mean it's a high carb diet. And when we say a, a low carb diet, de facto we mean it's a high fat diet. And protein is sort of in the middle basically. Okay, so fact number two about saturated fats. If you just reduce saturated fat and then eat whatever you like, and usually that would be more carbohydrate, you don't get a benefit. In fact, you get an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. But this is randomized uh, trial evidence from many years ago. There have not been any trials recently. This is from the 60s to the 80s, uh, these trials. And what they show is that if saturated fat is reduced and in its place you increase polyunsaturated fat, that's from oils and uh, uh, fish is included in there, but largely it's the omega-6 fats, you get a reduction in cardiovascular risk. Okay, so that's point number two. So replacement matters, what you replace your fat with. The third fact is it's even more complex, and giving reductionist messages has been problematic. And this is some work we did um, where we, instead of relying on people telling us how, how much they eat and uh, what they eat, we decided to go straight to the blood test, and we looked at blood fatty acids. And this was a huge project across eight countries of Europe. It's the world's largest study in two respects. One, for the number of diabetes new onset cases we assembled, 12,500. And two, and, and that was from a base population of uh, 350,000 people across eight countries. And two, this is the world's largest study of blood fatty acids. Blood fatty acids are a reasonably specialized measure, and they're expensive to measure, so it's not uh, easy to do so. And what we found here is that across this uh, 12,500 cases in these eight countries, 
When we looked at blood fatty acids that had uh, 14, 16, or 18 even chain uh, number of carbon atoms, there was an increased risk of developing diabetes over time. The higher the level, the higher the risk of diabetes. But exactly opposite was the case when the fatty acids, saturated fatty acids, had 15 or 17 carbon atoms. So the odd chain ones, they were related, the higher the levels, the lower the risk of diabetes. What does this mean? It's quite complex, so bear with me. Firstly, not only is fat not all the same, but also saturated fat is not all the same. Yet all our messages have just been about reducing saturated fat. Secondly, the careful interpretation comes here. These fatty acids are almost exclusively from the diet and particularly from dairy fat. These ones are more complex because they're a mixture of what you get from your diet, but also what your liver pushes out. And what this led us to conclude, and uh, we published this uh, in, in, in the Lancet Diabetes Endocrinology, is the fourth fact I wanted to share with you, which is that it's not just about the nutrient. We need to go back to the food sources, and we have ignored that in dietary guidelines. Okay, So all these different foods are rich in saturated fat, but their food matrix is not the same. They all have different properties uh, and uh, in this scenario, a calorie is not just a calorie, okay? Because they go through different, um, you know, brain and neuroendocrine systems, reward, brain reward, satiety, hunger, effects on the microbiome, physiological other effects. These do differ. So nutrition is really complex, but we can still derive important messages that we can take home as what we might do in practice. So some examples of this, um, we, in that same study, the INTRAC study with the 12,500 new cases of diabetes, uh, when we examined the associations of red and processed meat intake with developing diabetes in the future, there was a higher risk. But when we looked at fermented dairy products, yo yogurt and cheese, there was a reduction in risk over time. We did the same in a 10-country uh, study uh, for cardiovascular disease this time. Okay, this is for in, uh, coronary heart disease and very similar findings. So when you look at red and processed meat intake, there is a higher risk over time of heart disease, heart attacks, whereas if you look at yogurt and cheese, they're related higher intakes with lower risk. So there's a picture building up here, and this is the summary on dietary fats, that we are now beyond the low total fat era, and we need to look at the quality or the type of fat the food sources matter, and we must focus on the types of foods, not just the nutrient. I hope that message has come through. Okay, and the third thing I wanted to raise with you in this confusion to clarity theme was about quality aspects. So we've covered the fat quality already, but let's talk about wider. So current government advice in the UK is that 50% of our daily energy should come from carbohydrates, and most other countries have similar. In reality, in some countries, particularly South Asia, carbohydrate intakes are actually much higher. But what about quality? So there are these four things that which give carbohydrate-rich uh, foods their uh, properties in relation to glycemia and diabetes. Their fiber content, whether they're processed and refined or whether they're whole grain, what their glycemic response is, meaning glycemic index and glycemic load, and What's their structure? Are they solid? Are they liquid? These are the four things that give quality properties to carbohydrates. And these carbohydrates are obviously not all the same. So for fiber, there is, I've just shown you one uh, slide on this. This was a meta-analysis of world studies on this in uh, The Lancet uh, just last year. For every eight gram of fiber higher intake per day, there were multiple health benefits. So for type two diabetes, which is down here, you can see that there was a 15% risk reduction for each eight gram higher fiber intake and so on for mortality uh, and, and for coronary heart disease and for colorectal cancer. So higher fiber intake is good for you. The current dietary recommendation in the UK has gone up from 24 grams per day to 30 grams per day. Okay, most of us don't achieve it. So there's a lot of work to do to get more fiber intake. 
Um, then what about this solid and liquid? Now, of course, everyone has heard and knows clearly about the soft drinks and the sugary beverages, but it wasn't always the case. When we started this first, uh, this is all our research, so when we published our first study on, on, on this topic, at that point there was, in the totality of world literature, there was one systematic review from the Harvard group in the US, and they had not done certain things which we wanted to improve on. They had not, for example, adjusted for obesity levels, and uh, th that we thought was an omission. So we did this in three different ways to study different types of sugary beverages. We looked at soft drinks, we also looked at artificially sweetened beverages, and we looked at fruit juice. And uh, this study went for scale in that same study that you've now got familiar with, the Intrax study, very large study with four million person years of follow-up, 12 and a half thousand cases. We also went for depth closer to home. So in, from Cambridge, we have set up a study, Epic Norfolk study it's called, and it's in Norfolk. And there, what we did was to measure uh, food, uh, dietary intakes with a very, very detailed method, seven day food diaries, everybody filled out for seven days what they ate and drank, which was a lot of burden on participants, 25,000 people in this one. And then we also went for the breadth. We uh, put together all the world literature on these topics. And what we found across these three was very consistent that more sugary drinks consumption as, at as little a level as habitually consuming just one soft drink per day was associated with about a 20% greater relative risk of diabetes over time, adjusting for all sorts of other factors that epidemiology allows for physical activity or education, um, energy intake, all sorts of things. Okay, who believes that evidence? Who thinks sugary drinks might be? Some are skeptical, some think it's okay. Well, <laughs> the soft drinks industry put out a big statement saying we were masquerading as academic. We're not academic at all. Well, that Epic Norfolk study, I'll have you know, coding up those food diaries for seven days per person took 16 years. So I don't think we're masquerading as academic, with due respect, and uh, it is a difficult field to study. The government thought otherwise, and our work was cited in government uh, evidence reviews. It got into this report, and our work, plus other work, and of course lots of activists and uh, public health people, together influencing this change uh, that the uh, guidance was put out to limit uh, the intake of sugary beverages, and, and to reduce uh, free sugars intake. And this is a low-hanging fruit for public health. Our evidence was also incorporated in the WHO guidelines and has had an impact elsewhere. So the summary on carbohydrates is that quality matters. We should, uh, in this order, we should avoid added sugars, we should minimize sugary drinks, and we should refi uh, reduce refined uh, carbs. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater whole grain and high fiber foods are good, which a lot of, some of the low carb regimes don't pay so much attention to. Okay, so a tip to take away, if you're looking how to look at that, as you go around supermarkets shopping, look at the total carbohydrate intake and the fiber intake on the back of the pack, and if the ratio is more than 10 to one, avoid. If it's less than five, it's fantastic. If it's in the middle, it's not bad, okay? Right. So, is diabetes reversible is the next topic I want to address. And gradually over time in diabetes, what happens is that everything goes in the wrong direction. So your risk of, you know, your glucose levels goes up, your beta cell function deteriorates, your weight goes up, you get all these complications we discussed before, your cardiovascular risk goes up. What interventions would slow all of that down what will be that ideal intervention and will reduce cardiovascular risk and not even just level out the need for medication, just take away the need for medication. Is that even possible? When I went to medical school, I was taught absolutely impossible. I was taught, and not just me, and I was taught by some of the best. Um, so the understanding physiologically was that because by the time a person actually presents They've had years of damage to the beta cell, and it is irrecoverable. And really, the options potentially are drugs, but not really for 
uh, reversal, therefore management. Bariatric surgery is where the whole idea first came from, where obesity surgery, the side effect of it was that diabetes went into remission. So then we started asking the question, well, can we achieve it without surgery with food? Okay. And this work um, was done uh, by uh, Roy Taylor in Newcastle, what I'm about to show you, and Mike Lean in Glasgow. Roy Taylor was one of my teachers when I was a medical student in Newcastle. Definition of remission, stop taking all the glucose medication, sorry, uh, anti-glucose medications, diabetic, uh, diabetic therapies, uh, and in their case, even antihypertensive treatment for hypertension. And despite that, you should have normal glucose levels on two occasions separated by six months. So for over a year, you should have normal glucose. That's the definition. So they set up this study, and uh, it was a randomized controlled trial, actually run from uh, clinical uh, general practices. Three things I want to show you here. First thing here is that compared to the control group, which was usual care, those who went on a 800 calorie per day diet for three to five months, a quarter of them achieved 15 kilogram weight loss. That's a really meaningful weight loss, 15 kilograms. The second thing is that in the entire group, 46%, nearly half of people, achieved remission. All their medicines were taken off them at the start of the trial, and they remained diabetes-free. And these were people who had pretty bad glycemic control at the start. And the third thing is there was a dose response. So the more the weight loss, the greater the remission. So those who lost 15 kilos or more, nearly 90% of them at one year were in remission. Okay, so there's a dose response. And they've gone on then to publish two-year results about the durability of this. And 36% of those who started at the beginning were, remission free, were in remission at two years of all medications. Now, this is a real game changer in the field. Diabetes does not have to be lifelong. And this matters actually psychologically as much as scientifically because we can now look our patients in the eyes and we can say, if you're up for it, have a go. Now, there is a critical window. You can't endlessly do it. If you've had diabetes for 20 years, it probably isn't going to work. But certainly within the first six years of a diagnosis, perhaps up to 10 years, it is a possibility. And this shows what happens in just eight weeks. This is the amount of fat in the liver, nearly you know, 36% here. And in eight weeks, it's gone. 2% is left. And what this also does is it uh, uh, gets your pancreas and the beta cells working. So you've got the um, pancreatic fat content has decreased and the insulin sensitivity has increased. So they've done these neat experiments and, and tested their hypothesis that this works. So what about low-carb diets for achieving remission? Now, most of the low-carb RCTs that were done were not done on the basis of stopping all medication and then putting people onto it. What happened was they put people on low carb and then realized people did improve their glycemic control and therefore their diabetes dosages, medication doses were coming down or they were uh, even stopping in some cases. But it was not a, a priori like in that direct study that I just showed you earlier. This is a busy slide. I'm not going to go through every little point on this, but the overall point is that when low-carb diets uh, have been given in relation to control diets, uh, or most classically low-fat diets, for three months and up to six months, there is certainly a decrease in glucose levels. This is all people with diabetes. But by one year, that difference isn't maintained. So short-term, low-carb diets seem to be effective at a population level. This does not, of course, tell you what will happen to me as an individual or to you as an individual. This is the average. It may well be that for some people it's a game changer and it just changes them for the rest of their life. But on average, this is what happens. Okay, so what is low carb? Well, it varies a lot. Uh, most uh, people, uh, even in those RCT, uh, RCTs that I showed you, although supposedly they were on low or very low carb diets, most people don't actually attain that sort of level for any length of time in these RCTs, uh, and, and they're variable. And typically, this would translate to uh, eliminating 
really much of carbs uh, across all these food groups, uh, and as a result, increase in uh, full fat products and animal uh, proteins, and uh, can eat non-starchy vegetables. Long-term safety of low-carb diets, there have been some uh, questions raised about it. Not a huge amount is known, certainly not from RCTs, but from prospective uh, observational studies. This was published um, in 2018, showing that if you follow people who were not in an experimental way, but were naturally just on different levels of carbohydrate intakes, there's a U-shaped relationship, and there's somewhat of a sweet spot at around, uh, actually it's about 48 or 50 percent of energy as carbs, and if you are much below that, there's an increased risk of mortality. And if you're much above that, there's an increased risk of mortality. And this was in uh, all the studies they could put together from the world literature. So I wanted to cover uh, the issues about prevention of diabetes and the potential for reversal, because I think this is very exciting in the field at the moment. And the NHS is committed to now rolling out uh, this program uh, of the very low uh, calorie diets that I showed you in 5,000 people. So watch out if that comes uh, your way, if it's relevant to you. So in the last part, I just want to say a little bit about these two things, individual versus population level factors, because this matters a lot as well. So what I've been showing you is really at the individual level, what people should do. What we put in our mouth is our responsibility. And of course, there's a lot of finger pointing as well. Oh, well, you know, you're, you're big because you can't control what you eat. Or you're thin because your metabolism is all great and, you know, you don't have to work hard. And yes, biology plays a part, but ultimately these are individual level factors. Beyond this, there is a huge amount of influence on what goes into our mouth. Okay, and there are massive interdependencies between these different arenas, global situation. You know, the coronavirus is here. We don't know how it's going to affect our food, right? People are stocking up. People are panic buying. So what are we going to be eating? So these factors influence us. We say fruit and vegetables are good for us, not in some parts of India where there's arsenic, right? It'll kill you. So these factors are really important to think about, and we have to think at the macro level, and we have to take a systems approach. So this was a nice article by a great colleague of mine uh, in, in uh, Boston. Our food is killing too many of us. Now, they say improving American nutrition, but of course, we want to improve nutrition everywhere. Here's the picture on ultra-processed or highly processed foods, which are, have no resemblance to whole real foods at all. <laughs> and uh, the availability in our households is massive, and I'm, I'm afraid UK comes top. <laughs> so in the UK, the availability of ultra-processed foods is 50%. And in separate research, ultra-processed foods have been uh, associated with all sorts of uh, serious health endpoints. And Everywhere, we're saturated with what to eat and what price promotions are given to us. So you go down supermarkets and what's under price promotions is often not the healthiest of things. And our high streets are full of all sorts of enticements. We did this research a few years ago and published it in the BMJ. It was a very simple idea. In our Fenland study, some of you may have taken part in it, I don't know, and if you did, thank you. Um, we did a very simple analysis. We just looked at the number of takeaways that were between people's place of residence, their home, and their place of work. And we analyzed two very simple things. We divided it into quartiles, or fourths, of how many takeaways they passed between home and work, and what their energy intake was, the, the um, uh, uh, consumption. And then we also looked at their BMI, or their body mass index. And Compared to the lowest, these folk who pass between 50 and 165 takeaways a day, they, they have both higher intake of takeaway food, and they also have actually quite significantly higher body mass index. So the envir environment matters. Now, sometimes epidemiologists are accused of saying the bleeding obvious, but I make no apology for it because the food industry, some elements within it, unless you show them the evidence, they will not believe it, and you cannot give policy. So one of my colleagues, Dame Teresa Marteau, has been publishing 
what you might call very obvious evidence, but it is helping to shape policy. If you have bigger wine glasses, you will drink more wine. Okay? It needs to be shown in a scientific way because people just say, nah, I can control how much I drink. Size of the glass doesn't matter, etc., etc. So the final points I want to make are that people need help, and pointing fingers is just not good enough anymore in the 21st century. And this is some work done by my colleague, uh, Jean Adams, um, at, at my unit. And there are what we call low agency and high agency interventions. Low agency means you don't have to think about it. You pick up your toothpaste, it's got fluoride in it, you don't have to worry about fluoride. Okay, that's low agency. High agency is when you have to think, oh God, what is a balanced diet and what did that woman say? Should I eat this or should I not eat that? That's high agency. You need all your cognition, you need education, you need to be living in leafy Cambridge to understand some of that. Okay, so the, the point is that we need low agency interventions. And finally, to food as medicine, let me tell you one story. This is just an N of one. And of course, as a population scientist, I like to look at millions of people at a time, but individuals tell important stories. So this chap um, in the US doesn't have the NHS, incurred a massive bill, lost his foot or toe, and couldn't afford the food. This was published in Time. Food as medicine, literally, was a program that was started by one of the insurance providers. If your glycated hemoglobin was up and you were food insecure, basically poor, you were given a prescription for fresh food pharmacy. What you got there was education, dietitian review, pharmacist review, a kit including how to measure stuff, and food provision at low cost. In fact, to you it was given for free, but the company produced it at remarkably low cost. And this chap said, now I know what healthy food looks like and what to do with it. And this program has been rolled out into uh, a bigger pilot uh, and probably will be rolled out across different states of the US. But basically with that, it seems to be massively cost saving while at the same time giving food as a prescription. So this is uh, a huge amount of information. I'm not going to read everything out, but this is about why and how we need systems change for the food landscape. And one bit that I will highlight is this part here, which is at the moment, if you go along to your GP, I would be very surprised if for many conditions you get very thorough dietary advice. For, for diabetes, you absolutely should. And in the UK, we are reasonably good, but I bet you there are some people here who don't get much of that advice. Other places, it doesn't happen. But what certainly doesn't happen is we have nothing in our electronically health record about nutrition. We want to change that. We want to put, just as when you go for your diabetes clinic checkups and people ask you about what your blood, well, they measure your blood pressure and they ask you how your diabetes control, glucose levels have been, who is recording what food you've been eating and can give you advice. So I think we need to get that into the EHRs. We need healthy food prescriptions. We need medically tailored meals. And most of all, we need medical education of doctors because most doctors and nurses know almost zero about nutrition. Medical schools don't have a curriculum on, on uh, nutrition, not much of it anyway, about 1% of their curriculum. So a huge amount needs to be done. And the final thing here in this food as medicine is that, of course, diseases don't happen by themselves. I've already shown you the cardiovascular and other complications. Multimorbidity is a massive problem, and with multimorbidity comes polypharmacy, lots and lots of medications. And each of those medications have problems and side effects, and they interact, and people fall over, and all sorts of things happen. So this is one I've highlighted. When you have diabetes, um, you have the greatest uh, chance of having uh, far more conditions. A person with diabetes will on average have 6.5 other conditions, okay, across all these. So the advantage of food is that, of course, it'll affect all of these. 
rather than medicines that target often one thing at a time. And in the case of diabetes, look at statins. Statins will reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease, but make your glucose controls worse, right? So they work in opposite directions. So they're obvious examples. So my summary, really, my giveaway or takeaway message is that we previously used to think of when people have diabetes, then they can worry about what to eat. Then with primary prevention, we started to think about, let's look at people who are at risk of diabetes and improve them. But really the understanding is it's got to start here, not wait till you're here or here. And it's got to start early, it's got to start with children, because by the time we are middle-aged adults, it's too late. And even young adults, it's too late. And type two diabetes in children is increasing. And uh, this is a really important point. So what I um, uh, advise is that in all populations, we need to have a healthy weight. Uh, quantity of food matters, but quality is very relevant because a calorie is a calorie and it's not. Um, focus on foods, not isolated nutrients. Consider overall eating patterns. And of course, non-dietary factors are important, physical activity, smoking. Of course, there are special considerations in people who have diabetes. And if you go on some particular dietary regimes, then of course your doctor should be aware and you need to monitor blood glucose and you may adjust or need to stop certain medications, which is a good thing. So to get from here to here, and apologies, I didn't mean to make a, se a, a sex-based stereotype here that is men and women, <laughs> but it's just what I found on a rapid look. Um, individual and family factors matter. Government and policy are needed, and we need a systems approach. And food, indeed, is what we need to be doling out, not medicines. And the last thought I want to leave you with is the six Fs, which is food is indeed about feasting and fasting. It's about family, friends, and fun, because Food is not just about, oh, well, I'll get sick if I eat this. Of course, we eat food as part of our culture, as part of our family. It's about health. It's about society. And of course, it's also about planetary sustainability. So all of these things make food the right medicine. Thank you very much. And thank you to all my collaborators and funders. <laughs>
Thank you. Um, can you be someone with a BMI of 22 to 25 and suffer from type 2 diabetes? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And our work in different ethnic groups confirms that. So the typical, there was a very, very neat study, which was just a picture in the Lancet, no words. <laughs> and it was called the YY paradox. That was Professor John Yadkin as the one Y and Professor Ranjan Yajnik as the other Y. He's from India. John Yadkin is from London. Yadkin and Yajkin have exactly the same BMI but the percent body fat and the fat distribution in the two gentlemen, totally different. Okay, so Yadkin is not at risk of diabetes quite so much, whereas Yajnik is. Um, so body fat distribution is hidden within the BMI. BMI is a very crude measure. And one very interesting thing is that in that graph that I showed you, almost with an exponential relationship between BMI and diabetes, what is critical to understand is that even at the very low end of BMI, under 23, if you went down to 21, your risk of diabetes was further reduced. So yes, people do get BMI, uh, and, 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 and classically uh, South Asians might be one example. Yeah. Thank you for an absolutely brilliant talk. Thank really you. enjoyed that. Um, one of your, your good foods was whole grains. And it's something that's always puzzled me. What, what is it magic about whole grains? Is it fiber content? Is it uh, the mixture of um, high GI uh, starches? What is it, what's so yeah. magic about whole grains? Okay, so whole, great question. Whole grain, as the name implies, is intact. It hasn't been refined down and processed. Um, and it has a combination of some of the factors you've mentioned. It, is higher in fiber, which is why to judge the whole grain-ness of a food, you can apply that ratio I showed you, which is the carbohydrate to fiber ratio. So it is packed with more fiber because you haven't refined it and taken the outer layers away, which contain the fiber. Uh, it is also uh, lower GI, not higher GI. It's lower GI, which is beneficial for you. Um, those are the two main advantages. Uh, and that's why it, um, because you get a low glycemic response, when you eat it, your sugars don't spike up immediately or within an hour, they go up much more gradually, which is kinder to the release of insulin from the pancreas. That's the reason. Hello. Hi. Is, is there any advantage of having meals at a regular time every year, every day, rather than just sort of randomly when you happen to think of it or just feel a bit hungry? That's a tough one. So the research on that is not so solid, but ultimately in the weight and the weight gain issue, whether you have it broken down into lots of different meals or three meals a day and two snacks in a day, which is your more standard sort of advice, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and perhaps a little coffee break and a little afternoon tea break. Um, or whether you have it all lumped together in just six hours, as in that time-restricted feeding, um, it doesn't seem to matter in terms of the total calories you're going to get in, because the amount will matter. But for chronic diseases, there may be something more in spreading it out rather than having it all together um, over a reasonable time frame, but not munching and crunching the entire time until you go to sleep. Um, so the research is not so solid. Uh, Roy Taylor, who has done that pioneering work with the reversal, his view is that these um, sort of fixed eat this way regimes should be thrown out of the window. You should eat when you feel like it and eat only till, in fact, you should eat till before you feel satiated because there's a time lag between feeling full um, and, you know, the brain, sorry, between being full and the brain telling you that you're full. So when you're slightly hungry, that's when to stop. Uh, but I haven't answered that question that well. It's because the research isn't so good on it. My own view on it is um, 
do what works for you around your work, around your busyness of your life. There's nothing magical about having to have breakfast. I have myself published research previously uh, showing that uh, the fewer calories you have later in the day, the better. You know that whole thing about, what's that adage about, uh, old adage about eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pauper. And I have published on that, but I've changed my view about it now. <laughs> because as long as you um, add some of these ingredients that we've been talking about, actually you could eat uh, like a not quite like a king or a pauper, but like a prince much of the day. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, Sorry, where are you? I'm here. Oh, hello. Hi. <laughs> hello. Um, Sorry, my brain is gone. Um, it's all right. <laughs> HbA1c yes. has been the marker for diabetes. Yes. And I believe at the moment in the UK, 48 is the Correct. magic number between n being not diagnosed with type 2 and type 2. But between 41 and 48, yeah. it's pre-diabetes. Yes. What's pre-diabetes? Okay. So, pre-diabetes is a condition where you have what we call non-diabetic hyperglycemia. What does that mean? It means, basically, if we go back to this slide here, essentially, the way we diagnose diabetes is with a blood test. Okay. It's almost a normal distribution. In some populations, it's bimodal, but in a Western European population, it's almost normal. And what glucose levels indicate is this continuous distribution. So where do we draw the line to say, now you have diabetes, now you don't. So we've drawn that at 48 for HbA1c or 2-hour glucose 11.1 or fasting glucose 7 millimoles per liter. But it's not just pulled out of a hat. There's a reason behind it. And the reason is in studies where you look at the relationship between glucose, any marker of glucose, HbA1c or glucose itself, and uh, retinal, uh, retinopathy, or cardiovascular disease, you see that it spikes up after that level. Okay, so that's where it, because diabetes to me, it's the label actually is only the starting point. It's what it gives you in terms of complications, that's the issue. So pre-diabetes here was on two hour glucose level is this IGT, but for HbA1c between 41 and 48, it's exactly that. It's on that continuum to cardiovascular risk. There's nothing very magical, to be honest, about the cutoff of diabetes. That's why we now want to know whether you have prediabetes. And there's a whole NHS program um, on picking up whether you have prediabetes with your vascular health checks in people age 40. Does that make sense? Are you clear on that? Yeah. So it's a state of non-diabetic hyperglycemia. Hi. Um yeah, first of all, thank, thanks very much. I'm really excited to, uh, uh, to ask questions to uh, someone who's an expert in this sort of field. Because about eight months ago, I, I changed my diet. And it's mainly my own device because, you know, there are so many out there. They all conflict each other. Uh, right. And it's, it involves a lot of what you've covered tonight. So uh, I'm really happy that I've uh, cut out sugar and alcohol and, and red meat and things, stick with fish and, and white meat. And um, I still like my, pro my meat protein. But yeah. uh, one of the things I've done is in order to try and get fat um, without saturated fat is I actually consume olive oil mm -hmm. now on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just drink it. Yep. Um, uh, it's through a combination of a, a publication that I read and also the general life expectancy of people in the, in the sort of yep. a lot of olive oil eating countries. Yep. But um, I'm wondering if there's another way of getting polo and mono, mono unsaturated fats into your diet that's maybe a bit tastier. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, lots of options. So I mean, the olive oil thing, the PREDIMED study, which came from Spain, is, is a randomized controlled trial in this space. It's, been, it's fallen into some disrepute recently because they had to do a sort of retraction and republication because they hadn't quite randomized. So, uh, you know, that's one of the problems of doing trials in this field. Um, and in that study, what they had done was on a background of Mediterranean diet, because Spain is a Mediterranean country after all, what they did was they gave people either randomized into extra uh, dollops of uh, extra virgin olive oil or background of Mediterranean diet and nuts, 30 grams a day, 
or background diet and uh, the third group was low fat. Okay, that, that was the three groups. And both the olive oil group and the nuts group had massively low, well, 30% lower risk of cardiovascular disease, those who were high risk. So olive oil has benefits, but it's not a panacea because actually in a weight control program, of course, it'll give you calories. But if you're not worried about weight, if you're worried more about uh, weight maintenance and longer term disease risk, olive oil is good. Alternatives are plant-based sources other than oils. So avocados are typically very rich in omega-6s, okay? And actually, some of the vegetable oils and sunflower oil, they're all very high in omega-6 fats, which are PUFAs, uh, polyunsaturated fats. There has been some controversy out there about the safety of, of these oils. We have published a lot, the Harvard group have published a lot. We think they're perfectly safe. Um, and not everyone, and particularly for cooking, because olive oil at very high temperatures of heating actually may release certain things which aren't that great for you. So these other oils are pretty good to use too. So there are, um, uh, yeah, those other alternatives. Okay. A very great note to end on. Professor Bruhi, thanks for a super evening, a marvelous example of how research can lead to very practical benefits for literally millions of people and uh, particularly uh, enjoyable is the idea that this young man won't have to swig olive oil from the bottle but he can have a bag of nuts instead so on so many levels thank you very much thank you